morning to you all. This morning we'll start with a little Thanksgiving verse from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength and seek his face always. Let's ask his blessing upon our time together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather together, we pray your blessing upon all we say and do here today, that it would honor the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you have done for us, are doing in us, and will do through us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I prepared something a little lighter and different today. So turn in your Bibles to um, John chapter 21. One of my favorite scriptures of all time. It's page 1075 in the Pew Bible, if you want to follow along. In Proverbs chapter 30, it tells us that every word of God is flawless. Perfect in every way. So here's the situation, the scenario in uh, John 21, the last chapter of the gospel. And Jesus is appearing to the disciples one more time. And Peter and six under other apostles weren't sure what to do. So they defaulted to what they knew. Let's go fishing. And so the seven of them got into a boat and went out fishing at night and fished all night long and came home empty handed. And Jesus is on the beach and he's got a fire going and he's got some bread baked and he's got a piece of fish on there. And he's just waiting for him to come back in so he can take him back to class for one more time. And uh, he pulls them, they pull up to the shore and Jesus calls out to them, don't, don't, do you have any fish? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. And Jesus said, well, cast your net over that side of the boat. And of course, they pull it up with a miraculous catch of 153 fish, which is too heavy of a net to bring up into the boat. Seven guys couldn't lift it into the boat. So they row ashore, they row ashore and then they're rowing towards the shore and the, all of a sudden they recognize who it is that's talking to them. And uh, John says, it's the Lord. And Peter, Peter goes, whoa. And he dives in and he swims. The rest of them come in in the boat and Jesus tells them to go and, uh, and bring the fish on shore. And so Peter, all by himself, drags the net of 153 fish, which was too heavy for seven to lift into the boat together. He drags the fish up on shore all by himself. So he's pretty pumped up in the moment, if you will. And that's when we have the famous conversation of Jesus reinstating Peter and commissioning him. So let's begin reading at verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. 
that he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against, the, against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. And if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So breakfast is over. And Jesus says to Peter, let's go for a walk. Now, I know that they went for a walk because John followed. So they moved away. And it was a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation that the Lord had with Peter. It was as intimate as it could get because of the three times that he asked him, do you love me? We all know that Peter denied three times, and so the Lord brings it back around. Do you love me, Peter? And Peter was a little hurt and humbled. But it was one-on-one. -on -one. Follow me. Jesus, who knows all things, told Peter how he was going to die when he was an old man. And Peter, in fact, was crucified, just as Jesus was, except for one fact, that because he did not want to, he wanted to die differently than Jesus did, so he was crucified upside down. He insisted. Follow me. It was a personal command, and Peter was no longer going to be going out on his own fishing. But he was going to have to follow Jesus where he led him. He was going to have to follow Jesus in all of his provision for everything that he would ever do and need. He was to take care of Jesus' sheep. He was to feed the lambs and feed the sheep. His whole life would be turned around and upside down, but Jesus said, follow me. And he did so in the knowledge of Jesus' knowledge of him. Boldly, strongly. And Jesus let him know, when you are an old man, so he was still young and he was still strong enough to, carry, to, to drag, we'll call it a seven or 800 pound bag of fish up on the shore. But when he was an old man, he would have experience in suffering for Christ, in suffering for the gospel, and he would pay for it with his life humbly and gratefully and in the intent of glorifying God by what he would do. And I love John. I mean, these guys were close. John was the one who ran with Peter to the empty tomb. John was the one who got there before Peter. And he follows his brother, and he follows his Lord, whom he loves deeply as well. And he listens to what's going on. And when Peter sees that John is following him, and Peter has been told, you're going to die for the gospel because you follow me. And he turns and he sees John. What about him? You're going to have me suffer all these things and follow you and give my life for the gospel and for you? What about him? What's, what's the story with him? Will he have to do that too? 
He said, don't worry about him. What you and I have is what you and I have. And what you and John have, what I and John have is what I and John have. And it's the same for every other disciple of Christ in this world. From that time until this time. I'm the pastor of a church, a senior church. And I expect different things. This wonderful woman over here ministers to young people, hopeless, as she said. It kind of overwhelms me, but she's been at it for many, many years and faithful. And I admire and respect that beyond words. I am grateful for what I have because Jesus has said, follow me. And as I said last week and have said many times before, I'm not here of my own volition. Follow me. And I asked you in an email to be ready to maybe share what you see the Lord doing in your life lately, over the last year. And we'll be taking a little bit of time in a few minutes to give thanks for some things. But I want to tell you something. I want to start that off, if I can, by saying that I have learned that the, what we are packaged in should have no bearing on what, peop, what I see, what you, the package that you sit here in, your body, your tent, should have no bearing the external appearances should have no bearing on what I think about you. I should seek to understand what Jesus has brought you to. Anne tells a story of young boys with no father. The things that happen to us in our life leave scars. They, they construct us into who we are as people the wounds that we have borne. And so any judgment I have of you as a person has no foundation or basis to be part of my understanding or evaluating or thinking about who you are. You are Christ's child and you have been instructed just as Peter and John were to follow him. And I'll share something with you, very fresh. It was a long time ago. It's just, this is a twofold story. It was a long time ago that I was thinking about the different people in the church. I'm going to say it's probably seven or eight years ago. And one person in particular came to mind. And the Lord placed his hand on my inner vision and I saw this person praying working in the yard picking up branches raking up leaves in intimate fellowship in that moment with the Lord the Lord allowed me to see that and it's indescribable I just knew and felt and saw what was happening in this person And then last Sunday, after church, after Bill and Danielle left, we got together downstairs. I don't know, there were seven or eight of us, and we held hands, and we prayed for Bill and Danielle because of what Bill is, is continuing to go through. And I had the opportunity to stand next to this person and hold hands. And I got to tell you something. What I anticipated about that moment of prayer with that person next to me and what it was really like was amazing. The strength, the spiritual, the spiritual things happening right there, holding hands, 
I was overwhelmed. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Because if you look at what we're packaged in, it's kind of a distraction from the fact that there is an intimacy that's on a spiritual level that cannot be defined or imposed, but it has to do with the spirit that is willing to follow Jesus and to love him the way he wants to be loved and appreciated with a grateful heart. And so that's a tremendous learning experience to know that what I see sometimes affects very much what I think. But when the Lord gives us a lesson of that nature, it changes my perspective on each and every one of us. And to realize, and, and I talked to someone else just yesterday, another one of ours here. And he told me, he, he came at me and he says, how are you doing with this issue? And I, I said, oh. He says, well, I can take that off my prayer list. And I suddenly realized the diligence with, this, with which this man goes to the Lord in faithful prayer. But you never know. You never know. And there are those who are called to love. And there are those who are called to work. And there are those who are called to give. Because God gave some to be. Put your name on the list. He gave you to be what? And we share that bond as the body of Christ. It's the thing that we have in common is that he calls each of us to follow him. And we need to be asking him, where do you have me to go? What do you have for me to do? Sometimes it comes quite clearly and sometimes it's not so clear. It has to be pursued. And so that's what the Lord has taught me very recently. It's an ongoing process. And I want to thank the Lord for that. For the fact that what he does in me is a continual process that will never end until that day comes. So, let's go now to our time of thanksgiving and praise and sharing. You know, Peter told the church that not to be surprised when fiery, fiery ordeals came upon them in the forms of sickness, uh, financial issues, persecutions, discriminations because of their faith. Don't be surprised because these things are not strange. They're going to happen to you. They're a part of a fallen world that we live in. And we have to go through that. And Paul speaks to his people and says, look, clothe yourselves with humility and kindness and gentleness, especially to one another. We have to bear one another's burdens. And that is part of the culture that has been created here over the, over the years, to, to be comfortable enough with each other to realize our weaknesses, our strengths, our gifts, our lack, you know, and still to love one another fully with the love that has been bestowed upon us as Christians, as believers in Christ. And when we carry one another's burdens, it says in Ephesians that we fulfill the law of Christ to love one another as he has loved us. Anybody else? Well, let's just bow our heads and pray. Karen, can you come up and lead us in that last song? Heavenly Father, we do have so much to be grateful for. Most of all, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which has been bestowed upon us in the mercy of God at work in our lives. May we love one another and share that with each other 
as we go along this journey, as we each seek to follow you to where you want to lead us and how you want to guide us through this life. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time that we have this morning. May our hearts be truly grateful for the seasons that we're coming into. May we give thanks in all things that you are complete. And Lord, we just thank you for our time together today. Bless our Thanksgiving season. May our hearts be light in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that we share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.